Uh, my name is Pedro. Uh, I work at um, Social Games Company, and uh, we do our, all our uh, analytics stuff using Hadoop. Um, we also need to have any real infrastructure, so we run it on um, Amazon Elastic Cloud Produce. And uh, I'm here to show you how we handle uh, running uh, Hadoop jobs uh, in parallel as opposed to the native Java. API. Um, sorry, but this thing doesn't work. So uh, most of you will probably have heard of MapReduce, which is a distributed computing model. Uh, basically, the work is divided among several machines and several processes running on each machine, um, and it's a two-step, um, uh, two-phase um, um, processing. So the first phase is uh, the mappers, which get all the raw input, do some processing on it, for the results to the reducers. The reducers aggregate uh, the output of the mappers, do some more processing, and then finally um, write out the final result of your processing. And it's basically this. There's that sort phase in the middle which is handled by the framework. And that's uh, very important. That guarantees that all the values um, emitted for a single key by the mappers are sent to a single reducer. So um, keys, uh, the, a reducer will get all the values for a given key, so you're, you're guaranteed that you won't have any more values related to that key um, elsewhere. So basically, mappers get uh, the input as key, uh, key value pairs. They emit um, key value pairs as their output. These are then sorted by the, uh, by the framework and sent across the cluster uh, to the reducers. And as I said before, the sorting guarantees that uh, uh, a key, a single key is sent to a single reducer and all the values for that key are sent to that uh, reducer. And the reducers get a key, uh, get, they get key value pairs, but the, the key is the key that the mapper uh, output. And then the value is a list of all the values uh, output by the mappers. Once they do their job on this data, they emit a final uh, key value pair, which is uh, the result of your computation. Uh, as a short example, we wanted to have a world map. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Mozilla Glow, which was this thing that Mozilla put up when they launched Firefox 4, and it showed downloads in uh, near real time on a world map. We wanted to have the same thing uh, every time someone started one of our games on Facebook. So we took Mozilla Glow, which is uh, quite nice, and uh, we decided to build on it. And uh, we ended up with something like this. This was supposed to be a movie, but we ended not play it. So uh, imagine that those lights are going on and off. So basically, every time a, a player or a, a person starts a game on Facebook, you get little flashy lights. Um, we did the same for sales in different games, but I'm not going to show you those. But you can have different colors, and um, it looks pretty, and we like to show it to people who go into the office. Um, so we wanted to do this. But we wanted to do this um, in a day. <coughs> so the input for this, um, we have game start events. And we have the epoch for the event, and we have a payload uh, in which there is an IP address. So to do this, the mappers would group the, the, the events in five minute blocks and output a block ID and an IP address. Uh, the reducer would get the block ID and then all the IP addresses uh, that happened, uh, that started the game inside that five minute block. They then did a geo lookup and emit as the final value some, this is simplified because this is a JSON structure which is what Glow uh, uses. So basically we emit the epoch corresponding to the block ID and then all pairs of um, latitude, longitude. Um, 
that, that happen uh, in, in depth. Uh, again, it's just basically doing this. And we did this in uh, Haru. Uh, so MapReduce was uh, a, a paper that Google uh, put up a few years ago. And they have their own MapReduce implementation, uh, which obviously is in public. And Yahoo started Haru uh, several years ago implementing MapReduce and they've uh, transferred it to the Apache Software Foundation and it's open source. Uh, what is it? Um, it's basically a distributed programming framework uh, which implements MapReduce uh, but most importantly it does all the distributed programming thing uh, like data serialization, heartbeat checking, uh, node management, directory services, assigning tasks to nodes, uh, etc. It's highly fault tolerant. Uh, if a machine dies or a thread that's carrying out a task dies, uh, it just takes it out of a cluster, reassigns, um, reassigns tasks as needed. Uh, it starts, it does something they call speculative task execution. So they send a task to several machines the first one to finish, uh, to finish it wins, and then it just tells the others to stop working on it. So you don't need to worry about any of that crap, and you just focus on your business logic, uh, on the mappers and the reducers. Uh, Adu comes with a native Java API, um, so obviously you can uh, uh, write your uh, MapReduce code in Java, but you don't usually have a you know, a pile of um, enterprise Java architects around. So this Adu comes with a streaming API, um, and you can write mappers and reducers in any language you want, uh, even Bash, uh, if, you, if you want so. It also provides a distributed file system, uh, HDFS, which is, um, it's, uh, so every node uh, is part of HDFS, Every file you store in HDFS is replicated and is available on all modes, although not at the operating system level, so the operating system doesn't see HDFS, uh, only Hadoop does. Um, it also provides a distributed cache, which again is replicated uh, across the cluster and is seen by the operating system. Um, Amazon's Elastic MyProduce is a um, it basically on-demand uh, Hadoop clusters uh, running on EC2. They have, um, so Hadoop supports S3 as a, as a file system, but Amazon <coughs> obviously did some work on it and uh, their distribution of Hadoop has uh, much better S3 support than the standard ones. And also I think that their Hadoop instances are really close to S3. Um, so you can use S3 for input and output data, which is quite handy because it's virtually infinite storage and uh, highly redundant. And you just build workflows by sending uh, jobs to the cluster. Uh, Amazon calls jobs steps, and they call a cluster a job flow, which is sort of misleading. Um, S3 performance is quite good. We got uh, we got around 750 megabytes per second, um, which for our average event means that we get seven million events a second into the cluster uh, when when reading the input. So that's more than uh, more than a million. So there are downsides to it, um, unlike other EC2 instances where you can choose the machine image to use and you can customize it and all that. You have absolutely no control over the machine images. Uh, they're, they're, they're fully controlled by Amazon and you can't clone them and do modifications, etc. They come with PAL 588. Um, if the cluster dies and the clusters, uh, EMR clusters, die um, much more frequently than EC2 instances, I don't know why. Uh, they're designed to be ephemeral, uh, so you don't want to store your data on HDFS. 
because when the cluster dies, HDFS is gone and all the data is gone. Uh, HDFS is not available when the cluster is created, which means that you can't store, uh, when you start the cluster, you can't store things in HDFS to make them available. And finally, it's Devon, which I don't like. <laughs> So streaming, the, the streaming API, um, it's basically you do a cut before doing all the rest. Um, and instead of getting a, a key and a single key and then all, a list of values, the reducers actually get a key value pair. So the keys are repeated um, in, in streaming uh, jobs but everything is sorted, both the keys and the values. So for instance, if you wanted to merge three tables, all you have to do is set, so the user ID there is the key, and then you just have a, a, a merge field, and you, if you set it to zero, then you know that that's, that's going to be the first one you'll see for that user ID. If you set it to one, that's going to be the second one you see for that user ID, and so on and so forth. And um, when the, when the user ID changes, sorry. When the user ID changes, you know you have a new user and you'll never see that user ID again. Uh, streaming as, is a, a, as a limited API. You don't have access to uh, all the goodies of the native Java API. You can't set uh, the same uh, job parameters that you, that you can in the native API. Uh, it's a bit slower to run, but it's much, much faster to write the code for. So instead of writing 3,000 lines of Java, you write 100 lines of Perl or Bash or whatever, and uh, it's, it, it gets a job done much quicker. So you can't forget about the 10% time, 10% uh, increase in uh, runtime. Um, the problems with streaming uh, tasks started by how to run. Um, change rooted and you don't know where they will be. Uh, it's very easy to get files into HCFS when you submit a job, but you can't store directory trees on job submission. For native Java, you just get all our dependencies in the jar file with your mapper and reducer classes and that's it. Uh, it's not true in Perl. So you have to define your inputs and your outputs with that the, the streaming API has a lot of uh, nasties to make your life easier. So you find your output, you point to S3, to a bucket, input and output. Uh, they can be different buckets. You can use different access keys uh, for the buckets. For instance, for the input, you can only have uh, read-only access, and then you, you have a bucket where you have read-write access. Um, any, even in, in streaming jobs, any class that's in Hadoop's class path can be used as a codec to read data or, ri uh, or write data out. Um, so you basically just have to choose from one of the classes. This one is one of the most used, key field based partitioner, which is a uh, tab separated values, uh, basically, and the first index zero is the key and the rest of the line uh, is the value. And then you use S3 to store everything. Uh, so input data, output data, uh, any data, databases that you might need. And most importantly, your code, uh, which gets uh, stuck in S3. And this is how you specify the mapper and the reducer. So you write them, stick them on S3, and when you submit a job, uh, you, define, you define it like that, you define them like that. Uh, now we have to make use of the distributed cache. Um, so for instance, for that problem before, we needed to have the GOIP uh, database available to every, to every node in the cluster. So there's a cache file uh, switch tells how to uh, get this file and put it in distributed cache. And then you give it a fragment and what Hadoop does with this. So remember that we don't know where this thing is running. But if, if you give it a fragment, Hadoop will create a symlink in the current working directory of the task to wherever it puts that file. 
so you can access it as if it was uh, available locally. And if you start an archive, <coughs> it does something even cooler. Uh, you specify a fragment, and what Adu does, it will uncompress the archive and create a symlink to that directory, uh, wherever that is. So, basically, this is uh, this is the way to get your uh, Perl uh, dependencies um, available to the job if they're not available in the standard library. Um, because your mapper and reducer are also uh, stored in the same in the same location, and basically you just have to use use lib. Um, you could put a whole binary there. You could ship your own Perl. Uh, no, you don't want to do that. It's, okay. too, it's so much work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it later. <laughs> So basically, so this is a mapper for that uh, uh, world map thing. It's just this. So there's the use lib. Um, it's using JSON PP. And basically, what it's doing here is just getting the epoch and the payload. And the payload will be field five. Um, the JSON payload of the event. Uh, our events are F, several fields. Hadoop um, has this really cool thing, which are counters, so you can count stuff, and you're counting these on all nodes across the cluster, right? Uh, and at the end of the job, Hadoop will aggregate the counters from all tasks and will give them to you, um, you know, as, as aggregated values, which is quite handy to count errors, uh, records for sets, etc. The reducer is a bit bigger, and uh, there's lots of crap that's not in here. But basically, again, you just use lib, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm, access, I'm uh, opening Geolight City that, uh, as if it was uh, on my current working directory. Uh, just initializing some counters that I, I want to have um, at the end of the job. Again, just checking for uh, if some malform data was uh, uh, made it this far and just updating a counter. Um, here you check. So if if the time slot I'm in is not the same time, it's not the previous time slot. Then there is uh, it's a new one. So I'm going I'm going to write I'm going to write out um, the results from the previous time slot. Uh, again, this is more counter uh, counter stuff, more counter errors and. Uh, there's some code there that's just updating the data structure where the time slots are stored. Just stick the latitude and longitude in there. And then switch the time slot. And finally, uh, this is because of the JSON that uh, Glow expects. We just emit the last record at the end. And then the, all the job counters that... Uh, that uh, uh, well, so, quick recap. So, EMR clusters will disappear. You can't rely on them for storage of long-term data. They will go away, and your data will go away. So, use S3 for, for storing important data that you want to have around. Uh, all the values for a given key will go to a single reducer, and they will be sorted. Um, use S3 for everything. <coughs> And, and plan ahead how you're going to store your data in, in S3 and how you're going to get it there. Because if you store it in you know, a path like this, uh, there's a thing called Hive, which I don't know if you've uh, heard about, but it's basically a data warehouse uh, built on top of Hadoop that you query using an SQL-like language, which gets compiled into a MapReduce job which then gets sent across the cluster. Uh, if you have your data with things like this, Hadoop will be able to partition it uh, by, the, by this string, by run date. So you can then query Hive, just for instance, just for this date. And it will be much faster because it won't scan all your data. It will, it will just look in that directory. Um, about 
your data is in S3, but eventually you want it to end in some database or business intelligence uh, software. <laughs> Don't worry about getting it out on your main job. Just write to S3. And at the end of your workflow, you can just write a simple, a simple job that just reads the data from S3 and pipes it into uh, whatever database or whatever location you want, you want to have your data in. Um, <coughs> Carton, which is quite recent, but uh, which I'm using uh, enthusiastically, makes this uh, much, much easier because you can... Uh, I call it shipwright for humans because um, it is, for me at least it is shipwright for humans. So it reads dependencies from my file PL. So when when you write your your mapper and your your reducer and the models that that will support them, you just write the my file PL and as as usual, Carton will read the dependencies from there, figure out their dependencies, etc., and will install them locally uh, to your app. You. You then just have to deploy it, uh, including the Carton log file, run Carton install dash dash deployment, and that will install everything, um, install all the dependencies, and then you just make a tarball of that and stick it on S3, and uh, and that's it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll I'll be putting this up later on, and I'll a slide with the uh, URLs for EMR things and Amazon uh, uh, Hadoop things. Where we put it? So, uh, yeah. Where we put it? Uh, slide share. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.